We have one more <laughs> thing to do. We're not done yet. And that is the interview that I did with uh, a gentleman that I just met by accident, and his name is Bill. Bill and I had an interview. So this is Bill Johnston and me in our interview. Good morning, Bill. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much, Joe. And thank you for being with us today. Now, could you tell uh, everybody your name? I'm Bill Johnston. And uh, give us a little bit of uh, background. Let's start with uh, college. So you uh, went to Stanford University. Yes. And you were a freshman in 1950. 1950. And, and I graduated in 1954 with a degree in mechanical engineering. And then as a freshman, uh, you also joined the Air Force ROTC, as right. many young people did. And as soon as you graduated, uh, you were activated in the U.S. Air Force and received an officer's commission. And how long did you serve? I was in on active duty for five years. When you get your commission, you also take on a 17-year reserve requirement. After the Air Force, uh, when did you, uh, what did you do after the Air Force? Okay, that's when I was looking around to where I wanted to go, and I and that's exactly the same time as Lockheed Martin, uh, just Lockheed then, uh, was building a new facility to get into the space business. Went down to Lockheed and uh, interviewed him for a job. They gave me a supervisor's job right away. And uh, everything went well from there. So um, at one point, you began to uh, become uh, much more involved in various projects. And one of those projects uh, and turned out to be the Hubble Space Telescope. And at that time, I believe you were the manager of the Space Systems Division in uh, Moppet Field, Sunnyvale, California. That sounds about right. Okay, so well, retired in 1992 from Lockheed. Right. Okay. And so that means that you were pretty much working on it uh, towards the end of your career. I actually was, actually, that's a true statement. It was under my uh, supervision uh, the whole time. Okay, I, so if the mirror got construction began in 1979, that was called Perkin Elmer. Yeah, that's the one. And they started with a blank that Corning manufactured. They had some ultra low expansion glass. And so do you recall uh, any of that time? Uh, well, I just, yeah, I was going back and forth uh, between Lockheed and Perkin Elmer, which is back in New York somewhere. I've forgotten exactly where. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I worked pretty close with him, particularly at first. They, uh, uh, they decided they wanted me to get on it because I had a pretty good reputation for getting things done. And uh, so uh, I uh, quickly accepted, went, went into the boss's, big boss's office and uh, went over the blueprints to let me, so I could sort of get familiar with them. And uh, I did all of that uh, probably the first six months or so of the program. Very, very, uh, detailed because we were still developing details on how things were going to work and uh, we were working off of uh, preliminary engineering basically. It, it's a huge concept to try to bring into your head for the first time. I couldn't at that time everything was classified so I couldn't talk to my wife about it or any of that so um, we we, 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 we developed a little code so that I could give her some idea of what I was doing, but <laughs> it was, uh, you have to be careful at that point in time. It was, you know, we wanted to beat the Russians and uh, you couldn't let anything escape. And I had a top secret clearance, of course. By that time, uh, they had compartmentalized it so that you only got top secret or program only uh, clearances, and you get a you get a badge that's got a bunch of squares on it, and different numbers put in there. And different numbers were 
refer to different programs that you were clear for us. But I got one that had a lot of them on there, a lot of numbers, because I was going to be going from program to program. I had to have access to get into other programs besides Hubble. Okay, and so um, you were kind of maybe involved even before they had made the decision for Perkin Elmer as the uh, optical contractor. Uh, oh yeah, they were. They had already pretty much uh, agreed how we were, who we were going to use. There was okay. Perkin, there was Perkin Elmer. There was uh, Kodak. Um, other other ones back in Rochester area. There's a lot of them back there. Okay. So I, made, I made a lot of cross country trips for a while to coordinate what I needed because I was actually the manufacturing uh, director, man, manufacturing manager of building this thing. And exactly. And one of the things I have found out is that uh, Marshall Space Flight Center commissioned the optics company Perkin Almer to design and build the Optical Telescope Assembly, or OTA and find guidance sensors for the space telescope. Lockheed was commissioned to construct and integrate the spacecraft in which the telescope would be housed. Exactly. exactly. And you were in charge of the Lockheed end of things. Well, I was in charge of the Lockheed end of, of, the, of the business. And I'd had plenty of experience working on, we did a lot of satellite work, Lockheed did. And, right. Uh, so this was just one of those satellite things. And I had others besides my, besides this one. Well, but this is the one that absolutely upended the whole field of astronomy. It, it did for a fact. It did for a fact. But not right away. Not right away. I remember when we were all sitting around and getting the first feedback from uh, shots taken in space uh, by the Hubble. And the disappointment in the crowd when they, could, when they found out that things were not as crisp as we thought they were going to be. There was a little bit of smearing in there and so forth and so on. And then you found out why. What it is is there was a commission. It was called the Allen Commission. Yes. They looked into what happened, and what they found was that uh, there was a, quote, reflective null corrector a testing device used to achieve a properly shaped non-spherical mirror that had been incorrectly assembled and one lens was out of position by 1.3 millimeters. <laughs> That's not very much, Joe. No. Fortunately, they were able, because of that, to back out and create the uh, math that allowed them to create Redo. spectacles, Redo. literally, the, the glasses <laughs> that they put on the, uh, on the Hubble to fix its vision. And what a huge, huge, huge difference that made. We, you could see an eyelash on the, on the ground or something if you wanted to look for it. Right. Yes. Spectacular. That's, that was spectacular. Um, the spacecraft in which the telescope and instruments were to be housed was another major engineering challenge. Right. It, it would have to withstand frequent passages from direct sunlight into the darkness of Earth's shadow, which would cause major changes in temperature, while being stable enough to allow extremely accurate pointing of the telescope. Can you imagine that? How that would play on a on a thick piece of glass like that? You you had a perfectly focused, and then you didn't, and then you did, and then you didn't. They did another an, another interesting thing that I, I I still recall. They were having one one thing they were having a problem with was when you have separation of different pieces of equipment. They would have a ring, and it was had a, it was a pyrotechnic ring. And they would blow it at a given point in, in orbit. You have to work all the orbital mechanics out, but uh, at a certain point in, in time, it would explode and, and separate then primary and secondary uh, segment. And uh, the problem that came up with that almost right away was that uh, when it exploded, it put tiny, tiny fragments of metal in the air. And 
all of a sudden somebody said, that's gonna, that's gonna land right on, the, right on the mirror or something. So Lockheed came up with a, a new thing, which is we call it super zip. This, the zip cord was normally a pyrotechnic device that just blew up. And so uh, Lockheed engineers, bless their hearts, invented something called super zip. We knew we had to do something about the, uh, all this fragmentation and dust. Just the dust would, would, would ruin a picture, of course. And uh, so uh, the engineers invented this tube that you put the pyrotechnic tube, uh, pyrotechnic tape in, so that when it exploded and caused a positive charge or uh, gases in there, it would expand the tube so that it would cause the two parts to separate, but it held all of the uh, dust uh, in, inside that hollow tube. I thought that was pretty bitching myself. <laughs> 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 I was pretty impressed with that, and and uh, then we we used that super zip cord like that on everything after, afterwards. Well, that that is, I got to tell you, absolutely fascinating. It sure blew me away. I thought it was great. Really <laughs> I got in on some of the uh, uh, design and, and talking with the engineers. We, we would ask questions back and forth to each other, and try to figure out ways what what could go wrong with this, you know. And, that was one of the big things that we did. There were others, but that one there I liked a lot because it had so many different uses. Then also, um, I, I, I read, while construction of the spacecraft in which the telescope and instruments would be housed proceeded somewhat more smoothly than the construction of the optical device, uh, Lockheed still experienced some budget and schedule slippage. That doesn't surprise me, I, that, that's right. And then it says, um, on NSFC, which is Marshall Space Flight Center right. report, said Lockheed tended to rely on NASA directions rather than take their own initiative in the construction. But you have to be careful there because one of the, th the things that happen is a lot of these plans and, and uh, programs go into the Senate and the Congress to, to review all the time. And whenever that happens, and people are always wondering why there's these, there are these overruns. Well, you don't get to build the thing you're building as an, as an end item the way it starts off. You don't get to start it that way and finish it that way. By the time it gets from here to here, it's totally different. And the reason is the senators get there and they say, hey, we're saving own, uh, money for, the, for my constituents and so forth and so on. And uh, uh, so we want to put this over here, put this on. We want to get a toilet that flushes up instead of down. And all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so if you ever want to know why there are these overruns on all these American uh, government programs, you can't shut the Senate down <laughs> while, while it's going because they want to throw in. And, and we, get it, we got so many engineering changes uh, as time went by. Guys that thought they knew you know how to do stuff, don't know how to do it. So, uh, and right. we, we do what they wanted to have done, and then we have to undo it. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is, those people, those people have the, the, the money bags, and you get what they, <laughs> what they want, or you don't get the money. <laughs> so it's just kind of interesting you, what you have to put up with to do, the, to do work for uh, a DARPA or any of those people. The other thing that was interesting to me, it was interesting, it was always interesting to go back to and talk with the uh, lens maker, the people of the, putting the lens together, because they have, they have instrumentation back there uh, for, for polishing cameras like that, that is just unbelievable. So, uh, and I just, I just, from an engineering standpoint, I just love, <laughs> standing on the sideline for once and getting to watch somebody else work. And <laughs> I was probably going back there once or twice a month, well, twice a month, probably. And towards the end, I was back there every day, or go back for a week uh, while I got a package and ready to ship. Okay. But it's just too much 
of a coincidence that all of these things are happening and people don't let them go. And then you're going to be, of course, the, my go-to guy as far as honoring the Hubble. And I can't think of anybody more deserving, honestly, than yourself. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank pretty you. fascinating stuff. It's very, very fascinating. And I, I don't regret for a moment my decision after I got off active duty with the Air Force my uh, decision to go to, into aerospace. So uh, a friend of mine called me and said, you know, you really ought to go down there and talk to those guys. And so uh, I did, and I never regretted it. But Lockheed was just a wonderful company to work for. And I'm going gonna, to put it in. I'm going to put it in the, in the recording. So there you go. <laughs> I worked there 32 years. So I know, yep. a, lot of, I know a lot about them. And that's the end of that. So, okay, folks. Well, we've reached the end of our uh, show. And I want to thank everybody here. I want to thank um, the uh, people that stuck with this. And actually, just about 100 people stuck through the whole thing. And that's, that's really great. I, it was really varied. It was different. It was, uh, um, I think, fascinating. Um, I think this is a great way to celebrate uh, this amazing, amazing achievement uh, from 50 years ago today. And, uh, and actually 39 years ago tomorrow, uh, the SDS-1 launched. And uh, 59 years ago tomorrow, uh, uh, Yuri Gagarin launched. And uh, 30 years ago, on the 24th of this month, the greatest scientific instrument we've ever put in space launched. So good stuff, guys. Okay, the end. <laughs>